because we're at time. But yeah, we yeah. should go. And I've got my timings here and we're all set. So take it away. Okay, change the slide. Yes. Okay. 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 Here we go. <laughs> we are the women on call a couple weeks ago. We are the Women in Religion Project. Go to the next slide. Um, we began in 2018 with the Parliament of the World's Religions, and it was a joint project to add women to Wikipedia who were from the framework of religious traditions. It doesn't mean conservative. We actually are very progressive and feminist, and we tend to be interested and focused on adding cis and transgender women who are activists in their communities, do spirituality, um, and are in wisdom traditions, and indigenous traditions, and marginalized communities. Next slide. And this is our website. And I could go through the website, but I think what I'll do is just um, have Wynne come up. And she's going to tell you just a little story of how she accessed us and found us. And uh, the stories come from different places. So Wynn is one of our heroes who's been going on for quite a while. And there's no rush, guys. We're right on time. Um, in 2019, I went to a meeting of the American Academy of Religion. And when I got there, I found this group who was talking about women's bio, women's biographies. And I had been writing women's biographies for a long time, but the community newsletter that they were published in had a distribution list of 75. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is a way that I can really write the women's biographies um, with a larger distribution. You know, more people would see it. There are, so when I found this, I, of course, jumped into the Wikipedia. And um, two things I love about what I'm doing. One is that I can uh, accentuate the accomplishments of women who have not gotten the press that they should have gotten. And the other thing is that I love about it is that I can work with this group, this uh, women in religion group, which I really enjoy working with. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next slide. There's a lot of talk here about community um, and about the communities. And we saw in the, in the uh, morning that it goes up with community. So how do we keep community? Uh, we meet uh, once a month to edit on a Monday, second Monday of the month. We have a business meeting on the third, uh, uh, on the fourth Thursday of every month. We initiate edit-a-thons. Uh, we're going to the American Academy of Religion in San Diego, and we'll have a two-hour session on the Friday before the, the conference starts. Um, we have people who come in from various ways, like when, and um, you don't have to do the same thing. You don't all have to be editors. We have a person who's in the background who does Wikidata. You'll meet one of our people who comes in and out, but he's an AI guy and he uses our materials uh, to advance our AI project. We have uh, librarians like Jer, God, I love librarians, <laughs> who will sit there in a meeting and just do 15 references for us for someone's uh, a, a wiki page that they need work on. And so that's what's exciting to me, and that eventually you leave the page. You're mm -hmm. on the page, but then you become friends, mm -hmm. and then you become allies, and you want to help each other. 
-hmm. and you know about each other's illnesses and family events and weddings. <laughs> I think this moving off the page to the humanity mm -hmm. that was discussed earlier is really important. And, and so now you'll get into the particulars of our event. And let's move to the next slide. And Christine. Oh, and Christine Meyer. Um, I live in Moscow, Idaho, and I'm a longtime Wikipedia editor and contributor. My, uh, my username is Figure Skating Fan. My first edit was in 2007, and I've been a member of the Women in Religion Wiki Project since 2020. Um, next slide. This, I'd like to introduce you to someone. This is Genevieve of Paris, St. Genevieve. Um, I was a little disappointed because I thought we would have heard more about her this summer because she actually is the patron saint of Paris during the Olympics, but, mm. and, uh, it, and she's one of the saints that I have studied and worked on, um, under the auspices of women in religion. I've been focusing a lot on mostly Catholic female obscure saints. Um, next slide, please. So this is, um, what you're seeing here is our work list. And this is linked on our project page. And when I first found it, it was actually created by someone else. And the website that it was taken from is kind of sketchy. So there are lots of red links. There were lots of repetition. There was uh, some male saints uh, in there too, place names. And so for really the last four years, I've gone through that list. So it's pretty up to date. It's pretty a good source if you're interested in editing about female saints. Um, I also had to get rid of a lot of them because they weren't notable. There weren't, I wasn't able to find even three reliable sources to, so that they would be on, they would have their own bio on Wikipedia. Um, that was painful, but, um, you know, this, and, and writing about them, about these saints, have really taught me a lot. It's really challenging. It's, you know, they tend, like a lot of the articles that, that we women in red work on, you know, they tend to be shorter, less comprehensive. Um, they have in, incomplete or inadequate leads. Um, I mean, what does make a saint notable? <laughs> it's more than just, they're mm -hmm. just a saint, right? And what's a reliable source? So you know, those are all the things that we've had to figure out. Next slide. Okay, so these are some of the things that I have worked on. Um, and I wish I could had time to tell you about all of them because they're really interesting women. Um, their stories are heartwarming, exciting, inspirational. Um, and one of the things that come up over and over about these female saints is that they would, they literally gave up everything to follow their paths, to achieve bodily autonomy themselves. And away from the expectations for how they were supposed to be by their families, communities, and governments, often to the point of losing their lives. Often, many of them are saints because they're martyred. So they, would, so basically, they gave up everything to go their own way. Um, and they taught me some things about editing for Wikipedia, um, sharpened my research and writing skills. I've learned from them and the Women in Religion Wiki Project that the best way, and Rosalind always already talked about this, of overcoming these challenges about writing about women and eclectic topics on Wikipedia is to do it in community. Next slide. So this is a picture of some of us at the AAR in San, in San Antonio this last year. Um, and one of the things I think is our secret sauce that sets us apart from a lot of other wiki projects is our emphasis on community. Um, 
you know, it's, it's hard to be a loner, right, when you're an editor. And it's been really a an, an great thing for me personally is the support, encouragement, and mentorship I've received. Yeah. Uh, and I think that for, for me and for our other members, the Women in Religion Project has been a place to come and vent and get support. Mm -hmm. Something that's been invaluable to me, and to be honest, has at times kept me going. Mm -hmm. um, and we even presented conferences together. Yeah. Now we're going to hear from Robert. Hi, so I'm Hillary Warchnod. Wynne and I have been in the same book club for decades. <laughs> and when I retired, she recruited me to come volunteer with this group. And at first, I wasn't quite sure why, because I don't have a background in religion or librarianship. I was an English major, hence my username, Engmage. <laughs> and part of what kept me coming was because what were scheduled to be one-hour meetings ran for one hour and sometimes even less. And because mm -hmm. I identified what I thought was a significant issue when secondary sources reflect a similar gender gap in coverage, how do we prevent Wikipedia from perpetuating disparity? And they came up with what I thought was a pretty elegant solution. Identifying respected partners willing to work with us to publish books that turn original research into secondary sources with careful sourcing and citations, with open access publication, and with Wikipedians prepared to use results. And so I learned about Wikipedia, I learned some about editing, and began assisting Colleen Hartung, our general editor, by doing the copy editing of the last volume. And next slide, Colleen will tell you more about the Women in Religion series. I'm Colleen Hartung, and I have been part of the Women in Religion Wikipedia project from its beginning at the 2018 Parliament of the World's Religions in Toronto. A major focus of the Women in Religion Wikipedia project is the creation of reliable secondary sources about women. Studies show that there is less biographical coverage of women in trade books, encyclopedias, in journals, in news media, and more. And this deficit of reliable secondary sources is one of the factors that frustrates Wikipedia editors and makes it difficult to write a successful submission for some of the women on the women in religion lists. So we are engaged in practical efforts to address this problem. We work to publish collections of biographies about women who are not on Wikipedia, but should be. And then we use these chapters as secondary sources to support the creation of Wikipedia articles. I am the series editor for the Women in Religion series. The first two volumes were published with the American Theological Library Association. The third volume came out last year, and the current volume in progress are pub published under the auspices of the Parliament of the World's Religions. We publish on open access platforms, which means that the volumes are available free online. We publish in this way in order to promote an equitable access to knowledge, which is a problem on all knowledge platforms, including Wikipedia. On our project page, we have a list of women who have new Wikipedia entries as a result of these volumes. Several of these entries have been featured on Wikipedia's main page. We keep a running list of the chapters that remain to be covered on Wikipedia, and you can feel free to begin an entry on any of these women. Check out the links to the first three volumes of the Women in Religion biography series on our page, as well as the call for papers for our next volume focused on goddess and women-centered religions and spiritualities. So that's all on our wiki, wiki page, but we also have a couple of copies of the call for papers, so if you're interested, talk to us. And also I have a copy of the books, a hard copy of the books, if you'd like to take a look at them before you leave.
My name is Jerry. I'm a librarian, uh, and I found out about this group at Wikimania. Um, and the thing, I'm not a religion scholar, uh, and the thing I really love about it are those books. Because um, as a librarian, you sometimes like know a lot of things, but only like an inch deep. So um, it's nice that someone went like a mile deep for me, and I can use these peer-reviewed chapters to initiate writing an entry on Wikipedia, which I hadn't had the opportunity to do a lot of. I was so busy doing Wikidata and sort of inch deep kind of, of writing, and I wanted to do more Wikipedia writing. And there's such nice people too, so I really love hanging out with them. It's a real community uh, and that cares for each other. So that's part that I love. That's my tip. Thank you. Alicia. Yanya. We're having mic issues for our Kenyan scholar. Yeah, let me see if I can. Um, I see her and her hand is up. I don't have the power to um, bring her in, though. Does anybody know enough about this to share about it? What I can do is just show the slides um, because you can read about them um, that uh, this scholar began the concern, Circle of Concerned uh, African Women Theologians in 1989, and its main research agenda is investigating culture and religion as it affects women's lives. I really enjoyed having Telesia in the group. Telesia, by the way, if you jump in, just start talking over me, okay? If you get your microphone back. But otherwise, I'll fill some of the time here. And um, that um, I really enjoyed having her in here because I run a nonprofit that empowers global scholars to publish worldwide. And this is a very, very important form of publishing um, on two platforms worldwide. How they, and I like the closing words, how they can be interpreted to empower women and their communities. Um, she talks about certain points of gendered bias. Um, colonization is just everywhere in research and scholarship. Um, enforced Western philosophies overlaying these onto Kenyan women, enforcing Western knowledge systems on the African continent, patriarchal systems. Um, and I, I feel that her perspective is, gives us an extremely um, Kenya-centric look <laughs> or as a friend of mine said, Afrocentric scholarship um, by Africans for the world. Um, and of course, the, the um, profound problem of gender bias. I'm going to go for just one more minute, and then I'll go into my presentation. And I don't want to speak for Telesia, but, um, you know, some of this brilliant work speaks for itself. Um, uh, Rosalind, do you know anything about the Rapid Project Grant? Rosalind, are you there? Okay. Um, well, then I'll just go ahead and go to my um, thing. Uh, we seem to have lost the sound. So I'm going to continue trusting that um, everything is okay. But I'm going to put my phone number in the Q&A. And, um, and that way, oops, that's a question. Let me just see. I wanted to put my phone number in the chat. Sorry, I'll put my phone number in the chat. Um, I'll say text me at 202-558-6370 if you can't hear me. All right, now I'm just going to keep going as if everything's okay. Um, this is a project that I'm doing um, with Georgetown University, and um, I joined Women in Religion. My username on Wikipedia is Fortuna, F-O-R-T-U-N-A-A. -A. Um, and I started writing about Catholic sisters on my own. 
But gradually I found out that many Catholic sisters were not represented on Wikipedia. And I found out that all of these groups, Women's Center, LGBTQ Center, Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, and many others were very, very interested. And I was using women in red to find the women that I wrote about um, because Georgetown is a Catholic and Jesuit university. And I also happen to be Catholic. Um, I started writing in the Roman Catholic tradition, but absolutely my perspective is interfaith, Catholic, small c, very global. Um, but Georgetown has supported this because it, it flows nicely into our mission um, fr from the time of our founding. And um, this is one of the edit-a-thons that we held, um, and we've actually got another edit-a-thon coming up in the spring that I'll be notifying the Wiki Women in Religion about. But these edit-a-thons have brought together all of our community. I don't want to say I was the first, because as soon as I started doing it, I found that other people had been doing it in silos across campus. You did too. Okay, she says I've muted you, so I'm trying to unmute you. But why would I have the power to mute you? Um, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to unmute you, but it, it's not giving me the power to. Someone else must have muted. My apologies. Um, let me just say, I apologize, Kama, but if you guys can hear, hear me, I will keep going. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, Beth Marhanka has been a great partner in this, and I'm also watching our time. I'm going to finish up at 11.25. Um, and the Wikimedia DC people, one of the things is if you're trying to do a project um, if, in Wikipedia, if you're trying to um, uh, start something on your own, if there's anybody here who feels like a lone voice in the wilderness, then I encourage you to find a Wikimedia uh, group in your region. They've been an enormous help to us and they taught me a lot about editing and they stepped right in. It wasn't me who invited them, it was a colleague of mine. Okay, in the next two minutes, I'm just going to run through some of the sisters that I've written about. Um, why notable Catholic sisters need Wikipedia pages and how to create them. That was a piece that I did for Global Sisters Report. And that's a picture of the sisters at the monastery next to me. And the sister you see holding the football, she became famous actually on DC TV back in the 1970s and 80s for calling the football scores. And that's one of the Washington Redskins players with her. It's now the Washington Commanders. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through this because we, we have a little time crunch here. But Sister Eileen Needfield is one of the ones I wrote about. She got an a, a MD degree at Georgetown um, because Catholic sisters could study at Catholic universities years, even decades before women were admitted to certain professions. They were getting um, doctorates and MDs at Catholic universities. And some colleagues of mine, like Bill Sassato have, um, and Jane Malhotra, have found them and written about them. Helen Caldwell Day Riley, who was a best-selling Catholic author in the 1950s, and her name has uh, dropped out of a lot of women's history and the history of women in color, uh, women of color. And so I created her Wikipedia page and added her back in. So she's an exception to my Catholic sisters rule. And then um, her book, Color Ebony, was a huge bestseller. That's a picture of her with her son in the 50s. Um, and it was made national news. I mean, she was not unknown. How she became unknown after that, I leave it to feminist scholars to lament over. Sister Ilya Delio is one for whom I created a page. Sister Regina Pertel, this one got good article status. Um, it was my first good article, and I've tried again, and I just keep bumping up against um, problems with getting these all to good article status, but I want to become a better editor and get more good articles. Um, she was, uh, she, she cared for Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders and the media dubbed her the Florence Nightingale of the Spanish American War and Chris Shank. Now, um, just to say with Chris Shank, we are back on time. And so I'm going to hand it over to Clifford Anderson, um, who can use between five and seven minutes. And I hope we have sound from the room now. I do not have control over that. Okay. Um,
the project and it's been a lot of fun. I wanted to give um, Rosalind, if she can, the opportunity to say that's another project where Rosalind had these connections and this passion. And we met these women and their ability to edit on um, edit in their country is limited because of access to the internet. And so Rosalind was able to help them write this grant that um, provided access to the um, to sources so that they could provide their internet access and also for a coordinator. And Rosalind, you should just talk a little bit more about how great that has been. Um, it seemed to be responding to my email. So uh, I don't know if any of you have done rapid grants. There's a cycle. Of, uh, you can do like four a year. Um, but you have to do the first one and return in the report. So I'm a professional grant writer. So um, I, I felt really good that we got a rapid grant. They're up to $5,000. We got $4,100. Um, what we really needed the grant for is in Africa, one of the big problems is data packages. They don't have Wi-Fi in every home. I think she can hear us. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? That sounds working good. Yeah. 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 All right. Yay. Okay. I'm going to let Telezia do it. And Carol, can you go back to Telezia's slide? Yeah, and we're at... Um, we're at time for Q and A, but we'll take a little bit of time from the Q and A, and I'll go back to Telezia. Maybe she does. Um, presentation, yeah. Telezia, because there we go. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Carol. I don't know what was happening on my side, uh, but now I don't know whether you can hear me now. Yes, we hear you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry for for that. Um, I'll just take us through. At the circle, um, I know Caro talked about that shortly, but the circle of concerned African women theologians is a pan-African academic association of women, which was founded by Masi Haba Odioye in the year 1989. And uh, she had an idea of, of trying to bring in culture and religion as a spaces that women interact with on each and every day uh, life. Uh, and use these as parameters of theologizing. And so as a research organization, uh, it carries a gender-centered analysis of religious cultural content and impact on women, uh, children, and other dimensions of human life, including health and the environment. And this features a lot in their uh, publications. Um, next slide. In, in Masi Odioye's vision, of course, she had the idea of gender bias, and uh, this, again, plays a lot even in Wikipedia pages. And uh, she tries to uh, anchor the issue of colonization as one of the contributing factors that, uh, you know, drives gender bias even in uh, spaces of knowledge creation. And uh, this is an aspect that she tries to address uh, deeply in most of our books. Then this exclusion, again, as I've said, uh, plays again even in theological works and also in phil African philosophy where women are do not feature or women uh, concepts and ideologies do not feature in academic works. And so uh, they started uh, writing, that is the women of the circle, the theologians, but as one of us has already said, their books are not uh, in the online space you will find their resources in hard copy books and scattered across uh, libraries in Africa. Next slide. Uh, and so as uh, Rosalind was already alluding to, she helped us write this rapid grant uh, project uh, because of a few challenges that we had. One is that we have very few Wikipedia editors in Kenya, and we have managed to train a few, almost around 14, who are actively engaged in that. Internet access, again, becomes a challenge. Uh, we have to purchase bundles, and of course, it's not as stable, uh, apart from when you are within the city. If you peruse through um, the matriarchs, the circle matriarchs, you find very few with photographs in their articles. 
And as I've already said, most of their works are not in soft copy. So we will need money to travel to get these, uh, you know, books. And they're not as many. So very few copies we will find. So a lot of resources are required to photocopy that. And so this grant helped us now to expand the uh, Wikipedias uh, in Kenya. We have 28 now. But uh, as I said, only around 14 are active now. People keep on dropping because of these uh, challenges. And so our aim was to improve some of the articles that are already in Wikipedia and create tabs. This went real fast, thanks to our trainers, you know, uh, Christine and uh, Rosalind and the like. Thank you so much. Because, of course, we got lots of backlash uh, when we published this. We understood that we were novices, you know, in Wikipedia, but our styles of writing are different. Next slide. So with this rapid grant, we managed to work on several articles, improving them, but we uh, did work on four new ones, which are already on Wikipedia. I know they still need a lot of work to do, but we are really proud that we could do that. And you know, we can access that in our Wikipedia page of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians. You will realize that most of the Kenyan matriarchs have really turned blue from the reds. And we hope to continue doing this uh, going forward. Thank you so much, uh, Carol and uh, uh, everyone. Yeah. I'm so glad you got a chance and um, I'll hand it to Rosalind to wrap up and uh, then we'll have maybe five or six minutes for Q&A. <laughs> sure. Right, because of technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. Do we have questions? Mm -hmm. um, any questions uh, in the back there? And I'll monitor the Q&A. If somebody puts it in. Or Mike, or should I just, should I just use my voice? Um, you could... Use your voice or you could be. Um, I'll, I'll stay here if that's okay, just in the interest of time. So I'm Chris Schilling from the Wikimedia Foundation. Very happy to see the results from the Rapid Fund project. Um, just wanted to ask specifically about the secondary source work that uh, your group is involved with to create secondary sources on these topics. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you kind of identified publishers and sort of that process of finding partners to work with um uh like how like how how did that outreach process look like is what i'm curious about i think it's catch as catch can but <laughs> atla um came to us is that correct oh, yeah so someone approached you for that yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so at the American Academy of Religion, the question was about how how do we figure out who we can publish our secondary sources um, with our our volumes on um, biographies about women in religion, and um, it happened. The, it first happened at the American Academy of Religion. Um, we uh, somebody um, from Atla. Um, was at one of our presentations, and uh, she asked to have lunch. And, um, and so we did. And then, um, and so we published two volumes with ALA. And, um, and I oh, yeah, the American Theolog sorry, that's right. The American Theological Library Association. And, um, and they, they actually go by ATLA, they got rid of the whole thing. But anyway, anyway, so we published two volumes with them. And, um, and then we, um, explored uh, a relationship with the Parliament of the World's Religions. And um, so the third volume and that was published last year and the volume we are working um, on this year is with um, uh, published with um, the Parliament of the World's Religions. Um, our main criteria is open access. So um, I mean, it happened. It, it also we're always thinking ahead you know, having conversations about who are the open access um, publishers and venues that we can um, relate to. Like I was talking to Jerry yesterday and he goes, oh, we do open access. And I go, you do open access, you know? And so it's just about having stumbling onto people. I think also with the American Academy of Religion, we, uh, had we've had a number of African biography panels, and so those start with papers 
And we were asked by a publisher, uh, or Telezia was asked by a publisher, uh, and we will have a publication in 2026 of African uh, uh, essays. Um, but that is not um, open access. And they said we could pay them to open access. And so we're exploring what we can do, how to write a grant, what uh, and where we can go to make that work, open access. Thank you. But also, I I want to say one more thing. If it's if it's published by a publisher, you know, we'll take that. We put that up on our website, and we're going to write Wikipedia articles about those women. Richard, um, have you thought of any kind of uh, visual component like Wikimedia Commons? Because uh, I, I was thinking, you know, the lives of the saints. There's so many depictions of, of saints that you know could help, you know, visually expand this project. I was curious about that. So, Lucia, do you want to talk about African matriarchs and their fear of going online? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rosalind. Yeah, well, we, we look at the articles that are already on Wikipedia, and we realize that most of the matriarchs do not have uh, photographs. Uh, like we have seen with the saints and uh, the other notable women. But, uh, you know, the African women are cautious about their images going online because they don't know why you want to use them, what you want to use them for. And of course, there would be a monetary uh, component on it. Are you selling their images? Mm -hmm. uh, would you be earning anything out of it? So there is this, uh, you know, ethical caution, I would say, uh, and so there is a lot of uh, sensitization that is needed for them to understand that it is crucial to have their photographs on. Mm -hmm. So th that is a context and an issue that uh, probably we ought to navigate, but we understand it from its own context. Thank you. Also, um, I think that the third party is uh, kind of hard to navigate uh, when you can't get data access all the time. And it requires a lot of emails back and forth. And so one thing that we've done with women in religion at the American Academy of Religion, we just go around and take photos, you know, because then they're ours and we can release them. But in some ways, you know, you have to ask somebody, do you mind if your picture is up there, yeah. even though we're the owner of the photo? You don't want to just, throw people up who say, hey, I don't I don't want to be up here. Um, so we got uh, the women in the project, we we taught them how to use Wiki Commons with the Kenya project. But um, it was harder to get the third party in the life of the grant. Mm -hmm. And we're down to our last minute. Um, I any other questions? And we're also prepared to take your interest if you want us to email you about our monthly meetings with good old fashioned pen and paper. <laughs> How much that to bombard you? I'll also add one more little caution, just like Telezia was saying that some African women aren't sure why you want to put their picture up. Another problem is that Wikipedia is very public. And for some people, even if they're prominent, they're worried about dirty laundry being aired on Wikipedia, that somebody who knows something about the past could come along and tell the story, lawsuits, ex-spouses, et cetera. So people can become oddly vulnerable in that space. And I've tried to be very, very sensitive to the fact that not everybody wants their story told that way. On the other hand, I want them to tell their, you know, I want it to be there. And if they're already a public figure, the cat's kind of out of the bag, but I try to, I do try to be very, very, um, aware of the fact that there can be quite a sword to um, public life. We are at time. It's 11.45. So, Rosalind, if you want to close this out. Well, I think you just did, Carol. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Um, we'd love for you to stay involved. Oh, uh, Rosie? Yeah. Time, I have one more question or comment. We're on break now, so there's a little bit we should, we should also be aware that there are a lot of women in religion who are 
what I would call hiding in plain sight. Mm. I write about a lot of those women. It's the woman who her biography is about a woman who was a university professor for 30 years. And then you also see that for 30 years, she was the head of the Sunday school at her mm -hmm. church or some other kind of connection with religion. And to discount the fact that she has this connection with religion and she has something else that she's done with her life is to me like hiding in plain sight. There mm -hmm. she is doing this, but are we going to say, oh, well, that wasn't, you know, we're not going to count that. That's not the main part. We're only going to focus on this. And so I try to, when I find those women, I try to assure that their name gets associated with the Women in Religion Project with the template on the top page. Mm -hmm. um, because in my mind, I don't like to, to discount the fact that they had this in their life also. So, Very Also, a, a lot of the, I mean, we're talking about like nuns, the sisters, Mm -hmm. And it's part of their culture to not want attention, to not, I mean, they, they go and they cloister to be away yep. from the world. And they don't, that's not one of their values is to get out there. Right. So you, you also have to, to deal with that issue. Yep. For many women that we write mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And congregations handle it differently. I think it's also important to what Rosie is talking about is this this sort of demarcation between the public and the private mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that a lot of what women do in what might be called the private sphere sphere actually was really significant is significant and has contributed to the betterment of their communities the, uh, locally but sometimes statewide and sometimes nat nationally and that's been a big part of what we do is to try to um, push the boundaries of what might be considered notable. Right. So. I think we call that in academia embodied knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we try not to discount uh, when we write biographies in our essays, we try to talk about what they've overcome and all of their accomplishments and how it shaped them and others. And so I think uh, that's the beauty of biography, mm -hmm. is it's embodied knowledge and you have an, a giant context for a person's life. And uh, it's just not intellectual information or famous people I knew. Uh, and so I appreciate Rosie bringing that up and Colleen adding to that. And we will close out now. And right. thank you very much. Thank you all. Blessings. This was a wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Yes, Rosalie. Bye. Bye. Bye.